Dr. Sage here. Today we're going to cover chapter 16. In chapter 16 we're going to talk about DNA and RNA and how DNA makes a copy of itself, which is a process of DNA replication. In an earlier chapter you learned when that happens. That happens during S phase of interphase, but today we're going to learn how that happens. Some of the information at the beginning of this chapter you've already learned, because you learned the structure of DNA and RNA back in the macromolecules chapter. However, that has been a little while, so I'm going to very quickly run through the structures of DNA and RNA as a refresher. Okay, and you do need to refresh your memory in case you've forgotten this. And there are a couple of points that I probably didn't describe back in the macromolecules chapter that I will talk about now. One of them is I don't think I explicitly stated something that's called Chargraff's rule. So Chargraff was a scientist and what he discovered is that no matter what species he looked at, every species had the same number of A bases as T bases and the same number of C bases as G bases. So the number of A's always equal the number of T's, the number of C's always equal the number of G's. Now, although Chargraff discovered this, he wasn't sure why that was because we had not yet discovered the structure of DNA, which everyone knows nowadays DNA is a double helix, what we see over here on the left. Okay, so being a double helix, remember this is made up of two strands of DNA. So there's a strand of DNA over here on the left and a strand of DNA over here on the right. And these two strands of DNA are held together in the middle by hydrogen bonds due to complementary base pairing. It turns out that the base A always pairs up with the base T in DNA, and the base C always pairs up with the base G. So A will always be paired with T, and C will always be paired with G. So since every time you have an A, you're gonna have a T, and every time you have a C, you're gonna have a G, that explains Chargraff's rule. That the number of A's always equal to the number of T's, the number of C's always equal to the number of G's. The other thing that Chargraff's rule tells us is if we're told a percentage of one of the bases, like let's say that you're told that 20% of the bases in some organism is the base A, using that information, you can tell the percentage of the other bases. So for example, if 20% is A, then 20% has to be T, because you have the same number of A bases and T bases. That one's easy. But you can also know the number of the C and the G bases, because this has to add up to 100%. So if this is 40%, that leaves 60% left, and C and G have to be equal, so that means 30% C and 30% G. Okay, so that's the other thing that the Chargraff's rule tells us. So you can calculate the percentage of any of the bases if you're given one of the bases. Now, the reason for Chargraff's rule wasn't known until we discovered the structure of DNA. So the first work that was done that discovered that DNA had a helical shape was done by a scientist named Rosalind Franklin. And she was doing a technique called X-ray crystallography which is a way of basically looking at the structure of chemicals, even though chemicals are too small to see with your eyes. And it works kind of similar to if you go and get an x-ray taken of your hand in the hospital. Like, let's say you think you might have a fracture on one of the bones of your fingers. Okay, well, you can't see the bones of your fingers because they're covered by your flesh. But you go to the hospital, and what they'll do is they'll, they'll shine x-rays through your hand, the parts of your hand that the x-rays will easily pass through your flesh will darken the x-ray film on the other side of your hand. The parts of your hand that the x-rays will not easily pass through your bone, then the x-rays won't be able to expose that x-ray film and it will show up as a light area on the x-ray film. And by doing this, you can look at the shape of your bones on that piece of x-ray film without actually seeing your bones because they're covered by your flesh. We can do basically the same thing with a chemical and DNA is a chemical. Now, uh, kind of the hardest part of this is to purify the chemical. You have to make it so pure there's nothing else there, um, and you purify it to the point it actually forms a crystal. That's why it's called X-ray crystallography. So you take a, a crystal that you made out of DNA, and you basically shine X-rays through that DNA. And then the x-rays will more easily pass through certain areas versus other areas, just like they more easily pass through your flesh than your bone. And then that gives you a pattern, you know, kind of like this. 
Okay, now if you imagine DNA on its end, if instead of looking at it um, the way you're used to thinking about it, like a helical shape, it looks like this. If you were to look at it on end, you can imagine that DNA would have some kind of helical shape. Okay, and, and it would give you a pattern like these patterns here. Okay, and this was some of the first evidence that DNA has some kind of helical shape. Nowadays, we know that DNA is a double helix. Remember what that means is it's made up of two pieces of DNA that are attached to each other. So you have one strand of DNA here, and you have another strand of DNA here. Those two strands of DNA are held together in the middle by complementary base pairing, A pairs with T, C pairs with G. If you were to take this double helix and lay it flat, this is what it would actually look like. So you have one piece of DNA over here, Okay, and you have another piece of DNA over here. So that's why the double stranded, two pieces of DNA. What makes up one strand of DNA, like this strand right here? That is covalent bonds. What makes up the other strand is covalent bonds. What holds the two strands together in the middle, that is hydrogen bonds. Due to the complementary base pairing, A pairs with T, C pairs with G. Remember that DNA is a polymer made out of monomers. The monomers are called nucleotides. So we have one nucleotide here attached to the next nucleotide, attached to the next nucleotide. Each nucleotide is made out of three things, a phosphate group, a five carbon sugar, which is either deoxyribose in DNA or ribose in RNA, and a nitrogen containing base. And those are the letters you used to think about ATCG in DNA or AUCG in RNA. Now, uh, those nitrogen-containing bases also come in two categories. Okay, you can have the bases made out of two fused chemical rings, like the base A and G. Those are called purines. Or you can have the bases made out of one chemical ring, like C and T. Those are called pyrimidines. Um, so one kind of trick to remember these, because purines, pyrimidines can be a little confusing. Okay, well, you probably like pie. Everybody loves pie, right? But if you want some pie, before you can have the pie, you got to cut the pie. So you got to C-U-T, cut the pie. And I know P-Y is not how you spell pie, but pyrimidine starts with P-Y. So the bases C-U-N-T are pyrimidines. And then the base A and G are the purines, which begins to be spelled with P-U-R. Another trick to remember this is something is pure as gold. Okay, purines are the bases A and G. Now remember the DNA. If you look at the two strands of DNA, they look like they're parallel to each other, like these two strands are running side by side, but they're not actually parallel. What they actually are is anti-parallel. If you look at this strand on the left, Okay, it's five prime at the top, going to three prime at the bottom, but the strand on the right is going five prime at the bottom to three prime at the top. So the two strands of DNA are not parallel, they're anti-parallel. Five prime to three prime goes counter the opposite direction, five prime to three prime into the other strand of DNA. Okay, another part of Chargrass rule is that Besides A always pairs with T and C always pairs with G, you always have a purine paired with a pyrimidine. So if we look back at this double helix, you always have the purine like A paired with a pyrimidine like T, purine like G paired with a pyrimidine like C. Okay, you always have a purine paired with a pyrimidine. And what that does it causes the diameter of the double helix, so from one side to the other side, to be a uniform diameter. This double helix doesn't like jut out or jut in, okay? The reason for that is because a purine is always paired with a pyrimidine. Like if you had a purine with a pr purine, it would, the double helix would jut out. And if you had a pyrimidine with a pyrimidine, the double helix would jut in. But that's not what happens because a purine is always with a pyrimidine, it, you have a uniform diameter of the DNA double helix. And that's the other part of Chargrass rule. Okay, so that was a really fast recap of the structure of DNA. The reason I did that so fast is because you've already learned this. We learned this in the macromolecules chapter. However, if you've forgotten it, you need to go back and relearn it. Okay, so now we're going to move on to material that you have not learned yet.
In a prior chapter, you did learn when DNA makes a copy of itself. That happens during S phase of interphase. But now what we're going to do is we're going to learn how DNA makes a copy of itself. The way DNA makes a copy of itself is by a method called the semi-conservative model. In the semi-conservative model, what happens is you have your DNA double helix. It's made out of two strands of DNA. Those two strands of DNA are going to get pulled apart. And onto each of these two old pieces of DNA, a new piece of DNA is going to be built. Okay, so in the end, what you end up with is you end up with two copies of that DNA double helix. Okay, or a slightly more artistic representation of that. In principle, copying DNA, a process called DNA replication, is very simple. The two complementary DNA strands separate, and because each nucleotide can only pair with its complement, adenine with thymine and cytosine with guanine, each strand can be used as a template to build a new complementary strand, producing two DNA molecules. In the cell, DNA replication is a little more complicated, but the principle is the same. For clarity, we have untwisted the double helix. Remember that each DNA strand has a 3' prime and 5' prime end, and the strands run in opposite directions. DNA replication begins at specific sites called origins of replication. Proteins attach here and separate the DNA strands, forming replication bubbles which grow in both directions. Enzymes called DNA polymerases move along the template DNA strands and catalyze the elongation of new strands. Because DNA polymerases can only assemble new DNA in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction, only half of the new DNA can be synthesized in one continuous piece. The other half is synthesized in short pieces. As the replication bubbles grow, one daughter strand is synthesized continuously, while the other daughter strand is synthesized in pieces. The pieces are joined together by the enzyme DNA ligase. Eventually, all the replication bubbles merge, yielding two identical DNA molecules. Okay, so in that animation, it added some details we have not talked about yet, and we will talk about those details. But for right now, the semi-conservative model, what happens is you have two old pieces of DNA, let's say the dark blue DNA, they get pulled apart, and onto each old piece of DNA, you build a new piece of DNA, that would be the light blue DNA. And that's known as the semi-conservative model. Okay, and that's actually what everybody actually uses. But as an example, there are two other models that could have potentially been used. Okay, one is called the conservative model. And in that one, basically, you have uh, DNA double helix made out of two old pieces of DNA. When you make the new DNA, you make a completely new DNA double helix. So it'll be built out of two new pieces of DNA. So that's a conservative model. Or you could have the dispersive model. In the dispersive model, basically what happens is you take that old DNA double helix, you break it up into little pieces, and you rebuild two new DNA double helixes using those pieces. So in that case, every strand of DNA is going to have both old and new DNA mixed together. That's called the dispersive model. But nobody uses that. So what everyone actually uses is a semi-conservative model. You have two old pieces of DNA, you pull them apart, onto each old piece of DNA, you build a new piece of DNA. So what that means is in every DNA double helix, you have one old strand of DNA and one new strand of DNA. That's a semi-conservative model. Now, if you have a chromosome, what you want is you want to have a place where you can start copying that chromosome. And there is a place, and we actually did mention this in an earlier chapter when we were learning about binary fission, which is how bacteria do cell division and reproduction. And I talked about how in the bacteria chromosomes, they have an origin of replication or oocyte for short. Okay, the oocyte is where you start copying the DNA. So this is where you start to pull the two old pieces of DNA away from each other. Now this is done a little bit different in a eukaryote versus a prokaryote. So recall that prokaryotes only have one small circular chromosome. So if you have a circular chromosome, what you really want is you want a place where you can start copying that chromosome and go around the chromosome until you go all the way around making one copy of that chromosome. Okay, you don't want to go around the chromosome multiple times and make multiple copies of those genes. 
you also don't want to only go halfway around the chromosome. Okay, so you want a place to start copying, and there is a place that's called the origin of replication. And it turns out that bacteria, prokaryotes like E. coli, they only have one origin of replication. So that's where they take these two old pieces of DNA and start to pull them apart and start to build the new DNA on the old DNA. And then they just keep going around the chromosome, continuing to copy that DNA until in the end, they have two copies of that chromosome. So that's how bacteria, prokaryotes, copy their chromosome. They have one small circular chromosome with one origin of replication. Now, eukaryotes like us were different. We have much larger chromosomes than the bacteria chromosomes, and they're linear, like a straight line, they're not circular. So it turns out we do not have one origin of replication. Okay, what we actually have is we have hundreds of origins of replication. What happens is we start copying at all those origins of replication simultaneously, all at the same time. Okay, the reason we do that is because our chromosomes are very large. And if we only had one origin of replication, it would take too long to copy our DNA. We wouldn't be able to copy the DNA fast enough for cell division. So what happens is we copy at all of those origins of replication at the same time. And in the end, we end up with two copies of that chromosome, each with one old, let's say, dark blue piece of DNA and one new light blue piece of DNA. Okay, so now for some of the details. For DNA replication to happen, for DNA to make a copy of itself, it's going to involve several different enzymes that are going to be working together. So the first enzyme we're going to discuss is the enzyme that's going to take this DNA double helix and pull apart or separate the two strands of the DNA. The enzyme that's going to do that is called helicase. So what helicase does is it opens up the DNA double helix, creating what's called the replication fork. Like this is kind of like a fork in the road, like if the road were to split, that's called a fork. This is like the replication fork and the replication bubble because this looks like a bubble over here. So helicase opens up the DNA double helix, creating the replication fork and the replication bubble. Now, if all that happened was helicase pulled apart these two strands of DNA and nothing else happened, what would happen is those two strands of DNA, they would just zip back up together because they don't like being away from each other. They want a complementary base pair, like an A base over here wants a pair with a T base over here. A C wants a pair with a G due to complementary base pairing, hydrogen bonds between those bases. Well, helicase just took this A over here and pulled it away from this T over here. So if all you did was pull them away and nothing else happened, what they would do is they'd just zip back together. The A would rebase pair with the T, the C would rebase pair with the G. So you need something that can keep these two single-stranded pieces of DNA um, away from each other long enough in order to build new DNA on this old DNA and new DNA on this old DNA. Okay, and the thing that's going to do that is called single-strand binding proteins. And these do what their name basically says. These are proteins that bind or attach to single-stranded DNA. This is a single piece of DNA, not a double piece of DNA like the double helix. So these proteins bind or attach to single-stranded DNA and keep it single-stranded. They prevent these from reattaching to each other. Okay, so that's the next enzyme, single-strand binding proteins. Now, if you take your DNA double helix and you start opening it up, like pulling apart these two strands of DNA, there's actually a problem with that. And the problem is, remember, the DNA does not actually look like this. It's not laying flat. In reality, what happens is that DNA double helix has a helical shape, okay? Now, if you take these two strands of DNA and pull them apart, what happens is this helix that you should have, okay, what's gonna happen is it's gonna become super coiled. Okay, it's going to be a super tight helix or super tight coil. And that can create a problem because what that can do is that can break the DNA. And you don't want your DNA to get it broken. So what you need is you need something that can take that super coiled DNA and release that overwinding or overcoiling that happens ahead of this replication for. 
And the enzyme that does that is called topoisomerase. So what topoisomerase does is it relieves the overwinding that happens ahead of the replication fork. Now, if you're having a little trouble picturing, you know, this DNA double helix becoming super coiled because you're pulling apart these two strands of DNA, what you can do is get yourself a rubber band and, you know, stretch out that rubber band. And remember that rubber band will have like two strands because it's a rubber band and then twist that rubber band. Okay. And then after you twist it as you're holding on to it or somebody else is holding on to it, then take the two pieces of that rubber band and start to pull them away from each other. What you're going to see is that twist is going to become super twisted on either side of where you're pulling them away from each other. So you can see how this would actually happen. And the same thing happens to DNA and that creates a problem. And that problem is fixed by this enzyme called topoisomerase. Okay, so the next thing that we actually want to happen is we want to build new DNA on this old DNA. Okay, because we want to make two new DNA double helixes from this one DNA double helix. Um, but there's a problem. There is an enzyme that we'll talk about in a second that can build new DNA, but it cannot build new DNA on single stranded DNA, which doesn't make any sense because that's exactly what you need to happen. You need new DNA to be built on this old DNA, but it can't. Before that can happen, what you need is you need a little piece of RNA placed on your DNA. This little piece of RNA is called a primer. Once that RNA is there, then the enzyme we're gonna talk about in a second can go along and build new DNA on the old DNA, but it cannot do it without this piece of RNA first, which is called the primer. Okay, so the enzyme that puts that RNA primer there is called primase. So primase adds a little piece of RNA called the primer to your DNA. Okay, so so far we talked about helicase, single stranded binding proteins, topoisomerase, and primase. Those are the enzymes we've discussed so far that are some of the enzymes responsible for DNA replication. Okay, and then there are enzymes that can build new DNA. These enzymes are called DNA polymerases. And they can build new DNA very fast, about 500 nucleotides per second in a prokaryotic bacteria or 50 nucleotides per second in a eukaryote like human cells, like our cells. So let's say we have an old piece of DNA, this dark blue piece of DNA here, and we're starting to build a new piece of DNA, this light blue piece of DNA here. Okay, well the enzyme that's gonna build this new DNA is called DNA polymerase. Technically it's DNA polymerase three, and we'll, we'll talk about that point in a second. Um, and what it's going to do is it's going to add one nucleotide at a time. Remember, those are the monomers of building blocks you use to build your DNA out of. Like this is one monomer nucleotide, next nucleotide, next nucleotide. So it just keeps adding one nucleotide at a time. Okay, well, how does it know which nucleotide to add next? Okay, that's due to complementary base pairing. If the old DNA strand has an A base, since an A always pairs with a T, the next nucleotide that's going to be added by DNA polymerase 3 is going to have a T. And now you have A paired with T. So if the next base is available on the old strand is a C, well, since C always pairs with G, the next nucleotide that would be added would be a G base. And that's how it builds the new DNA strand, adding one nucleotide at a time to build the new DNA. Now, of note, DNA polymerase can only build new DNA in one direction. It can only build new DNA from five prime to three prime, okay? The reason for that is because this enzyme, DNA polymerase, does not have the ability to add new nucleotides to the five prime end. It can't, it just physically can't put them here. So it can only add new nucleotides to the three prime end. So if you keep adding new nucleotides to the three prime end, and what you're doing is you're building the DNA from five prime to three prime. So new DNA always grows from five prime to three prime, or the other way you can say that is you can only add new nucleotides to the three prime end of this growing DNA strand, the new DNA that you're building. Okay, so let's put all that together where we've gotten so far. You have your old DNA double helix, helicase, 
opens up the DNA double helix, creating the replication fork and the replication bubble. Single strand binding proteins keep it single stranded. Not shown here, topoisomerase would correct the overwinding ahead of this replication fork. Then primase adds a little piece of RNA called the primer. So in this figure, dark blue is old DNA, green is RNA. So primase adds this RNA primer. Then DNA polymerase three adds a new stretch of DNA. So new DNA is shown in red and the new DNA grows from five prime to three prime. Okay, pretend you don't see this stuff down here. We'll get to that in a second. Okay, but that's putting all those enzymes together we've talked about so far. Okay, so there's actually a bit of an issue with building the new DNA. And this issue comes from the fact that DNA is anti-parallel. So the two strands of DNA are going five prime to three prime on one strand, and it goes counter on the other strand, five prime to three prime, the opposite direction. Remember, DNA is anti-parallel. That's part of the problem. The other part of the problem is that new DNA can only grow from five prime to three prime when you're building new DNA. So let's say that we have this old DNA double helix here. We've opened it up, creating this replication bubble. We've put down the RNA primer, and then we start building the new DNA. We're building the new DNA from five prime to three prime. Okay, well, in reality, this is not static like this image. What happens is DNA helicase opens up the DNA helix, but it doesn't stop, it keeps going and it keeps opening up the DNA double helix more. So instead of it being open to here, it now opens it up to here. Well, this DNA strand just keeps growing from five prime to three prime towards this replication fork. And helicase keeps opening up the double helix even more. So it opens up to here now, where you just keep growing this new DNA from five prime to three prime. Okay, so this strand I've been talking about this top strand, okay, for right now we're going to ignore the bottom strand on these figures. Okay, this top strand, what's happening is it's growing in one continuous piece towards the replication fork. Okay, that is called the leading strand. The leading strand grows in one continuous piece towards the replication fork. Okay, so the other strand, the other old piece of DNA, this one down here I haven't talked about yet, what happens is you put your RNA primer down, then you build new DNA again from five prime to three prime. But now because DNA is anti-parallel, the direction it's gonna go from five to three would be this way. So to the left on this figure. The problem with that is that you're opening up the double helix this way towards the right. So then what has to happen so you have to put down another RNA primer and build another piece of DNA, okay, away from the replication fork. Then you'll put down another primer and build another piece of DNA away from the replication fork. So this strand on the bottom, that's called the lagging strand. And the lagging strand is grown in a bunch of little pieces called Okazaki fragments, named after the scientists who discovered them. And these Okazaki fragments grow away from the replication fork. All right, so putting that together, the leading strand grows in one continuous piece towards the replication fork. The lagging strand grows in a bunch of little pieces called Okazaki fragments growing away from the replication fork. The reason that you have a leading and a lagging strand is because DNA is anti-parallel. The two strands of DNA are going in opposite directions, five prime to three prime, and because new DNA can only grow in one direction from five prime to three prime, or from five prime to three prime. Okay, so that explains why we have a leading and a lagging strand. Okay, so let's back up a second. Let's go back through the ends I've been talking about, and we need to add a couple more. So helicase opens up the DNA double helix, creating the replication fork and the replication bubble. Single strand binding proteins keep it single stranded. Topoisomerase corrects the overwinding ahead of the replication fork. 
then primase adds a piece of RNA called the primer, then primase is going to leave. Then the next enzyme, DNA polymerase 3 joins, and DNA polymerase 3 builds a new piece of DNA in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. Then DNA polymerase 3 leaves. Okay, but there's a problem. The problem is right now, the way this is built, we have RNA stuck in the middle of our DNA. Okay, well, you do not want your DNA double helix built out of RNA. You want it built out of DNA. So then we need another enzyme. And this next enzyme is called DNA polymerase 1. DNA polymerase 1 is going to take this RNA primer, it's going to cut it out, it's going to remove it, and it's going to replace that RNA primer with DNA. That's what DNA polymerase 1 does. It removes the RNA primer and replaces it with DNA. But there's still a problem. The problem is there's one last little thing that DNA polymerase 1 cannot do, and it kind of seems silly, but it cannot form one last covalent bond. There's a covalent bond missing between these nucleotides. Okay, so it leaves a gap in the backbone of the DNA. So DNA polymerase 1 leaves, and the last enzyme, DNA ligase, joins. And what DNA ligase does is it seals the gap in this backbone. It forms that last covalent bond. All right, so let me put that all back together one more time. Now we've added two more enzymes. Helicase opens up the double helix, creating the replication fork and the replication bubble. Single-strand binding proteins keep it single-stranded. Topoisomerase corrects the overwinding ahead of the replication fork. Primase adds a little piece of RNA called the primer, then primase leaves. DNA polymerase 3 builds a new piece of DNA in the 5' to 3' direction, then DNA polymerase 3 leaves. Then DNA polymerase 1 joins. DNA polymerase 1 removes the RNA primer, and it replaces that RNA primer with DNA. Then DNA polymerase 1 leaves, and DNA ligase joins. What DNA ligase does is it seals the gap in the backbone, or it forms that last covalent bond between the nucleotides. Okay, now we've talked about all the enzymes you need to learn about for DNA replication. All right, so when we talked about chromosomes before, something that I mentioned is that in eukaryotes, Eukaryotes have very long linear chromosomes, and there's a lot of DNA. And the other thing I said is that eukaryotic DNA is never naked. It's never just DNA by itself. There's always protein stuck on the DNA. And we learned the term for that. That's called chromatin. Remember, chromatin means DNA with proteins attached to it. Okay, well, today we're going to learn what those proteins are and why they're attached to DNA. The reason is because, let's say you take just one of your cells, like one of your skin cells, okay, or I take one of my cells, one of my skin cells, and I take that cell that is so small that I cannot see it with my eyes. It's too small to see. And out of just one of my cells, I take the DNA and I stretch that DNA end to end. If I were to do that, then that DNA would be about two meters or six feet long. In other words, the DNA from one of my cells that is too small for me to see with my eyes is longer than I am tall. So how do you get such a long piece of DNA and pack it into such a small space? How you do that is using those proteins. Remember the DNA? has proteins attached to it. DNA plus proteins are called chromatin. Turns out these proteins are what help the chromosomes to actually fit inside the nucleus. So when most people think about DNA, they think of one of two things. They either think of the DNA double helix or they think of the highly compacted chromosome that you see certain, during cell division, those X-shaped structures you're used to thinking about. Okay, but there's actually several levels of chromatin compaction to get from here to here. So what we do is we take our DNA double helix, this blue thread here, and what we do is we wrap it around or wind it around a set of proteins. Okay, these purple blobs here. Okay, those proteins are called histones. Okay, so histones are proteins. 
And what happens is DNA wraps around the histone proteins. Why? To make the DNA take up less space. Just like if you've ever used thread before at your house, you don't have your thread just all like stretched out in your house. What happens is you have that thread wrapped around a spool. Okay, why? So that it takes up less space. Well, the same thing is happening to your DNA. Your DNA is being wrapped around these histone proteins, just like thread wrapped around a spool to make it take up less space. Okay, and that's the first level of chromatin compaction. And this structure, DNA wrapped around histones, that is called a nucleosome. So a nucleosome is the DNA wrapped around the histone proteins. And this is often called a beads on a string appearance because if you look at it, it actually looks like beads on a string. Like here's an electron microscope image showing you the nucleosomes and it looks like beads on a string. So imagine you have a string of beads. You take that string of beads and you coil it, you twist it. Okay, that creates a second level of chromatin compaction, creates what's called the 30 nanometer fiber. So after you wind up the DNA and coil it, then you fold it on itself. Okay, after you wind up the DNA and coil it and fold it on itself, then you fold it on itself again to get the final compact chromosome you're used to thinking about during cell division. All right, now for this class, for Bio 1, the level of chromatin compaction they want you to focus on is this first level here. Histones are proteins. DNA wraps around the histone proteins to form nucleosomes. And that's one way of making the DNA take up less space so it can actually fit inside your nucleus. Because remember, one of your nuclei from one of your cells has enough DNA to stretch out to be about six feet long. Okay, so how do you get your chromosomes, which you're used to thinking about them looking like this. Remember, that's what they look like during cell division. But that's not what they look like during interphase. During interphase, your nucleus would look like this, where the chromosomes are not highly compacted, not those X-shaped structures you're used to thinking about. Okay, but the level of chromatin compaction you have during interphase is the nucleosome level. The DNA is wrapped around the histones, so your chromosomes can actually fit inside your nucleus. Okay, and that was actually, honestly, a very quick chapter. Okay, one of the reasons that chapter was so quick is because a lot of it, the very beginning, or the whole beginning of the chapter, you've already learned. We already learned the structure of DNA. We learned that during the macromolecules chapter. So I went through it very fast. But if you've forgotten it, you need to go back and relearn it. Okay. All right. So that is the end of this chapter.